Hi, we're going to talk about an important theorem about line integrals called Green's Theorem. We're going to talk about this in a slightly different way than your textbook introduces it, although the textbook does eventually state it in the same form. All right, so there's a lot going on here. So I've got the theorem written down here, and we're going to kind of just dissect it and make sure we understand all of the vocabulary and symbols in this theorem and then we'll do an example where we use this theorem. Okay, so first of all, there's some information in this first line here about our curve. And so I'm actually gonna start at the end here and kind of work backwards and just make sure that we're clear about what all of those vocabulary words mean. So first of all, it says that our curve is a plane curve. So that means that the curve is in R2. Since our curve is in R2 and we have line integrals defined over that curve, that means our vector field F will also need to be in R2. So one important thing to remember about Green's theorem is that it is for curves and vector fields in R2. We will look at some theorems later that are extensions of Green's theorem to R3 that are essentially just different versions of these same symbols but written in R3. All right, next thing that we're gonna talk about for the curve, kind of working our way back here, is piecewise smooth. So we've already talked about that a few times. A piecewise smooth curve is a curve that can be made up of finitely many smooth pieces joined at the endpoints. So I've drawn here a few examples of some curves that are piecewise smooth. Uh, this last one, maybe a parabola with orientation to the right, or we could even just draw a complete circle here. Uh, those would be piecewise smooth where you have only one piece. We might call those curves also just smooth. The first two would be not smooth because they do have those sharp corners. You won't be able to find a smooth parameterization of the whole curve. They would be piecewise smooth. And then up here in our description of the curve, kind of working from the back here, the next word to talk about here is closed. We've also already talked about that. A closed curve is one that makes a complete loop. So its starting point and ending point are the same. So that's usually pretty easy to tell, especially if you have a graph of the curve, whether your curve makes a complete loop or not. Generally, if your curve runs into some kind of problem with using Green's theorem for the homework or the problems in this class anyway, this is usually the condition that is not met. So this is generally the one about the curve that is important to think about. There are sometimes some conditions about the vector field too. The last vocabulary word here says that C has to be simple. Um, so I'm just gonna draw some pictures here of simple and non-simple curves. But the basic idea is that a simple curve does not cross itself. So a simple curve would be like uh, the ones I've already drawn here. So a semicircle and then line segment or a circle or a parabola, or a line segment, all of those are simple. Non-simple curves would be things like a figure eight, or some of those curves that you might have looked at in polar coordinates. So we need to make sure that we check all of those conditions on our curve before we attempt to use Green's theorem. Uh, the next thing that it talks about is a region R inside the curve. So because we have a closed curve, we can talk about a region inside the curve. So any of these closed curves that I have down here, we can shade in a region enclosed by that curve. Then the next part here is about the vector field F. It says all of F, the divergence of F, and the curl of F are all continuous on an open region containing R, that would be the R, the region inside the curve, and C, the curve. So this basically means that F, and then the divergence and curl include all of the first partial derivatives of F need to be continuous on an open region containing our region R inside the curve and the curve itself. So this is another condition that sometimes is not met so that you need to be sure that you check if you're going to attempt to use Green's theorem. Okay, so once you verify that all of these conditions are met for Green's theorem, then there are two statements here. So these are the kind of the workhorses of Green's theorem, what you're gonna use when you apply Green's theorem to a problem. And there are two different forms here, and they have some vocabulary associated with each of them. This first one is called the circulation curl form. The integral on the left here is a work 
slash circulation slash flow integral. Uh, there is some notation on that integral sign which indicates the curve needs to be closed. So the complete circle on my line integral sign indicates the curve needs to be closed. We wouldn't really need to write that because it says up in the statement of the theorem that the curve needs to be closed. The other thing about that circle is that there's an arrow on that. So that would indicate a counterclockwise orientation. So orientation to the left. All right, and it says that the work slash circulation slash flow of F around C is equal to, and then on the right side, we've got a double integral. So that's going back to some stuff that we did in the last chapter, a double integral over the region R. Remember that R would be the region inside the curve of the curl vector. So that's why this is called curl form. This is the curl vector dot K dA. So remember that if your vector field is in R2, when you calculate that curl vector, you're really going to have a zero in the first two components. And it's just going to be your third component that has some partial derivatives in it. The partial derivative of N with respect to X and the partial derivative of M with respect to Y. Subtract of those when you do that cross product. And so when you dot that with the K vector, that K vector is the same K vector we've been working with all semester long. Uh, your K vector is just going to be 0, 0, 1. So when you do that dot product of 0, 0, comma, difference between some partial derivatives with the dot product with the vector 0, 0, 1, you'll just end up with that component, that k component of the curl vector. And so our textbook talks about this whole expression inside this circulation curl form as the k component of curl. Uh, so when you take curl dot k, I prefer writing it this way because that makes a nicer transition to those later theorems we're going to do, which are basically just extensions of Green's theorem. So my advice is to write down Green's theorem this way. Our book does eventually write it down that way a little bit later, um, but write down Green's theorem this way and it'll help you later in the chapter when we get to some other theorems. All right, so we have a circulation curl form of Green's theorem. Matt says that the work done by the vector field as an object is moved around the curve is equal to the double integral, so the total value of the k component of curl on the region inside the curve. So that might be kind of surprising to you. Uh, maybe not obvious that that would be true. The second form here is the flux divergence form. So it says that on the left side here, I've got a flux integral, flux of F across the curve is equal to the double integral of the divergence of F on the interior of the curve. So on the region R enclosed by the curve. So flux divergence form. So the idea is that when the when Green's theorem applies, it often provides a much simpler way to calculate circulation or flux than just doing the line integral. So we'll look at some examples below and then there are several in your homework where you need to decide whether to use Green's theorem or not. Okay, so we have an example here. We've got a vector field F and a curve shown in the graph and we are asked to find the work done by F as an object moves along the curve and the flux of F across the curve. So one way we could do those is just by evaluating the line integrals. So we could do that. We would need parameterizations of the curve and then do the substitutions and just do those line integrals. But Green's theorem actually provides a much simpler way to do both of these. The first thing we should check is that Green's theorem applies. So I'm just going to go through a little checklist here that I go through when I'm thinking about whether I can use Green's theorem. So first of all, I need the curve and the vector field to be in R2. I need my curve to be simple. It is. It does not cross itself. It needs to be closed. It is. It does make a complete loop where the start point and ending point are the same. And piecewise smooth. It is. Two pieces. I need my vector field F to be continuous and have continuous first partial derivatives on the curve and the region R inside the curve. My vector field F is made up of polynomial functions in both components here. 
So f is continuous and all of its partial derivatives are continuous everywhere. Okay, so we have verified that all of the conditions for Green's theorem apply and so now it's just a matter of doing Green's theorem. All right, so for part a, since we are asked to find work, another name for work is circulation, so we're going to use the circulation curl form of Green's theorem. So my curve here does have counterclockwise orientation. If you did not have counterclockwise orientation, then Green's theorem still applies, but remember that if you change the direction, then you're just going to have an opposite sign on your work integral. So actually Green's theorem could be stated without the counterclockwise orientation. You would just need to be sure that you have a plus or minus based on the orientation. But since this one does have counterclockwise orientation, I can just use the same orientation. I don't need to worry about a plus or minus out front here. Okay, so I'm going to calculate my curl vector and then do this integral. So remember that when you calculate the curl vector for a two-dimensional vector field, you already know two-thirds of that curl vector. The i and j components of that curl vector are going to be zero, and it's really just the k component that you have to worry about. So I'm going to find partial derivative with respect to x of 2xy minus partial derivative with respect to y of x squared minus y squared. So I'll end up with a minus negative 2y or plus 2y. So I'll get 0, 0, 4y. When I dot that vector with k, remembering that k is just the vector 0, 0, 1, I will just get my 4y. So I don't usually write out work for that dot product because I know what's going to happen when I do that dot product. I'll usually just calculate my curl vector and then go to my double integral. Okay, so I need double integral over the region R. That's the region enclosed by the curve of 4y dA. And so here's where all your knowledge of double integrals will come back to help you or hopefully help you, not hurt you. Okay, so sometimes we know that a double integral might represent an area of a region and then in that case we might be able to just write down the answer. This one does not. If I just had the double integral over the region R of 1 dA, that would be the area of my region R. Sometimes also we can decide just by looking at the region that a double integral might be zero. If I just think about the definition of a double integral and what exactly is happening there. This one will not. I can tell from looking at the region though that I should expect a positive answer from that. So I do need to go ahead and set this up. So let's go ahead and set this up. Our region R is a circle centered at the origin, the top half. So we're going to use polar coordinates. I'm going to go from theta equals 0 to pi, and then the region is R simple. So I'll think about going through the region in the direction of increasing R. We'll go from R equals 0 to 2. My Y is R sine theta, and then my dA in polar coordinates is R dr d theta. And then from there, you go ahead and do that double integral. I'll just write down the work here, and you can try that and check your work. Okay, so here's all the work. I simplified my function, I integrated with respect to r, plugged in my limits of integration, integrated with respect to theta, plugged in my limits of integration, and simplified till I got my answer, 64 thirds. So I do just want to make one comment. I sometimes see students that are a little confused between parameterizing the curve versus integrating over the region inside the curve. Sometimes I see students use here, they'll just plug in r equals 2 because they'll see that curve that has a radius of 2. But the important thing to understand there is that when you're integrating over the region inside the curve, the r is going from 0 to 2. So that r is a variable and your r will go from 0 to 2, not just being fixed at 2, which would be on the outside edge of the curve. So part of that has to do with thinking about what you're integrating over. Part B asked us to find flux. So using Green's theorem for that, we'll write down the flux divergence form of Green's theorem. And we'll go ahead and calculate our divergence of our vector field. So remembering that divergence is just going to be del del x of the first component plus del del y of the second component. So we will do double integral over the region R of 4x. And remembering that our region 
is that region in the first and second quadrants inside that circle of radius 2 and thinking about that a little bit. If you remember and think about definitions of double integrals and what that means, you probably can go ahead and write down the answer for this one without actually having to do the integration. If you can't do that, then you can set up the integration just like we did up above, except you'll have a cosine theta instead of a sine theta since x is our cosine theta, and you can evaluate all that integral and you should get the same answer at the end. But if you think about this, you can probably look at that and say this answer is going to be 0. Uh, this is 4 times the integral of x dA, and so that is taking function outputs, and so that is taking function outputs from the function f of xy equals x at every point inside here, and every point inside here that has a positive x is there's a partner point with a negative x that will give the opposite function output so those will all add up to zero so if you don't see that then you can set up the double integral and you can actually do it but I do encourage you to look for those shortcuts use that knowledge that you gained from that last chapter about double and triple integrals about recognizing when perhaps the integral you have is just the area of a region or when you can just write down the answer based on the geometry of the region. That's part of the reason we spent so much time doing that kind of stuff. So go ahead and try some homework using Green's Theorem and then we'll have another video where we look at another application of Green's Theorem.